Hello everyone. Uh, whether you're watching this right now live or whether you're watching it at some point in the future um, or whether you're listening to it on the podcast, welcome to the stream. Uh, I'm going to do something a little unusual today. I know many of you are here for um, project videos. Many of you also enjoy the podcast and this is going to be similar to uh, the podcast that other Joseph and I publish from time to time. So what this is going to be is this is the first and uh, what I hope will be a series of discussions on the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Piercig, uh, which of course I have here up on the screen. Um, and other other Joseph and I, in case you weren't aware, have major disagreements about this book. He's allergic to this book, and so that's why he's uh, not here on the stream. Uh, but, well, I'm not allergic to the book, and I actually find it to be uh, remarkably helpful and instructive. So what this is going to be is I'll probably stream here for about 45 minutes to an hour about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, and then I think probably uh, Tuesdays and Fridays, most likely, uh, uh, for the foreseeable future, I'll be streaming about 45 minutes to an hour of content about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And I'm going to go all the way through the book, and I'm going to explain what I think about it, I'm going to explain what I think he's trying to say, I'm going to explain you know, also whether I agree or not um, with with various aspects of what he says and, and the value that I find in the book and why I think it's so important, uh, not only in general, but even specifically for our day and age. Hey, everyone. Uh, great to have you here. Um, so this is going to be long form discussion. If you are mostly here for the project videos, uh, we've got some great projects coming up. I've started some really interesting ones. Uh, we're probably going to do a smelt in the near future. I've started uh, building a, a clay bread oven that I'm really excited about. Some of them are a little longer and may, may take some time. But um, anyway, so uh, that's that's a little update on projects, but I want to talk to you about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance mostly. Um, so it will be a long-form conversation, and it will just be me talking, although I hope that if you've ever read this book or if you're interested in reading this book as I move through, um, I'd welcome your questions and comments in the chat uh, so that we can all learn from each other, so that we can all get to a better understanding of the book and understand why it's important and what's it, what is important about it and the value that we can pull out of it. Um, I don't. I think that there will probably be about 15 of these. I don't think that I can do anywhere near justice to Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance except in about 15 uh, episodes. And so having gotten all that out of the way, I think probably what I ought to explain now is why I think that it's valuable to stream about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, why I'm doing this long-form discussion uh, that's going to take somewhere between, I don't know, 15 and 30 hours on a book that was published 50 years ago. And I want to answer that question, that question of, well, why do this in the first place from sort of two different angles. One angle is why in general it's valuable, and then the second angle is why it belongs here on the Good and Basic channel. So first of all, why in general it's valuable? And you know, it's a fair question, right? This is a book that's uh, 50 years old. It hasn't gained a whole lot of traction in academic circles. If you go on Google Scholar, you can find um, somewhere around, I think, 7,000 citations uh, where, it's, where it's been mentioned in academic papers. Uh, but it certainly hasn't, you know, there aren't courses. There aren't very many courses on Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance in colleges. Uh, it's kind of a cult classic. It's a book that many people have read, but it's still not... Uh, in many ways, you know, that popular of a book. It's not like, say, Harry Potter or Malcolm Gladwell, these books that, you know, so, so many people have read and that kind of enter our public consciousness in many ways. Uh, it's, it's, it's an old book, and it's also kind of uh, a strange book, as we'll see. And so there's certainly reasons why you might think, well, it's, it's not that valuable, um, or reasons why you might suspect that. Um, having said that, though, um, I think it's I think it's a strong candidate for one of the most important and profound books of the 20th century. I'm not sure it would win a competition for most valuable and important and profound books of the 20th century, um, but I definitely think it would be in the running. I don't think there's any doubt it would be in the running. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I want to talk about is because I think it's a terribly underrated book. I think it's a terribly underrated book. Uh, I think that... Um, sort of on a personal level and on a cultural level, so many of us would stand to benefit from the lessons gained. And I also think on a deeper philosophic or, or academic or intellectual level, I don't think I've ever read a book that is as profound or as important as this one. Um, what, one of the things that the author does in my description is he picks up all of Western metaphysics and philosophy like a, like a tree, and he shakes the roots clean and then he replants it. Uh, he's, among other things, he's proposing an entirely new sort of system of metaphysics and values. And, and for that reason, I've, al I've always wondered, well, why hasn't this book gained more traction? Why isn't it more of the subject of debate? Um, especially considering that the author is no lightweight. Um, I can't remember his IQ. He mentions it in the book, you know, not, not to obsess about IQ, obviously. Um, but 
uh, he's certainly a very intelligent individual. Um, wasn't a very intelligent individual. He passed away um, just a couple of years ago. So one reason that I think that this lecture series needs to be done is that it's a terribly underrated book. It's a terribly, terribly underrated book. I think it's also not a very well understood book. I've seen, I've listened to a couple podcasts about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I've even watched a couple of videos here on YouTube about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And uh, I don't think they do as good of a job as could be done. And although I certainly don't think that this will be a perfect lecture series, I think I can actually do in in very many respects a better job than most other people I've seen talk about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I don't think people uh, really understand what it is that he's going for. I don't think they really understand why he wrote the book, and I don't think they really understand the lessons that he hopes to teach us. Um, so I think not only is it an underrated book, uh, but I think it's also a book that is poorly understood. Um, broadly speaking, uh, a while ago when other Joseph and I read or made our videos about reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and Shop Class of Soulcraft, um, I was really interested by so many of the comments that you all posted. I was interested uh, to see the different perspectives um, and to see, you know, ways that they in many cases differed from my own or ways that I thought uh, they were perhaps a little unfair to the book. And I think that um, I can do a pretty good job of clearing up many of those confusions and helping people to understand the book uh, on a deeper level, understand it better. Uh, some of the comments in the chat right now are talking about uh, specifically motorcycle maintenance. And this is another really very curious thing about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance uh, is that, you know, just judging by the cover, judging by the title, you would anticipate, well, this is probably about Zen and motorcycles. And actually, if you'll open the book and go to the front matter, there's an author's note. What follows is based on actual occurrences, which, by the way, makes this even crazier, makes the, the narrative just absolutely stunning. Although much has been changed for rhetorical purposes, it must be regarded in, his, in its essence as fact. However, it should in no way be associated with that great body of factual information relating to orthodox Zen Buddhist practice. It's not very factual on motorcycles either. So that's another very funny and puzzling thing about the book is that uh, although the title, you, you would think it's about Zen Buddhism or about motorcycles, he says, you know, that's really not what it's all about. And uh, the the uh, comment in the chat from Hubris not, are you teaching quality? This is exactly what it's about, right? If you read the subtitle, it's an inquiry into values. And that really brings me to the whole reason of why I think, the, the main reason of why I think it's so valuable to talk about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance is because it is an inquiry into values. And in some sense, you know, definitionally, there could not be anything more important to talk about, to discuss and to understand uh, than, than values. Uh, in, in some sense, it's, it's almost definitional, right? If you discuss values, you're discussing what is of most value and, you know, what could be of more value than figuring out what's of value and then pursuing it. It's, you know, it's, it's tautological in some sense. Uh, am I teaching class? I guess in some sense I am. Uh, you know, I used to teach at a, at a university. So uh, welcome to Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance 101. Actually, this is really 201. Again, I want to go a little bit deeper. This is, uh, I, I can't go as deep as, uh, in, in this series as I would like to, but I'm definitely going to go deeper than I think. If you've ever listened to a podcast about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, I am going to go deeper than probably anything you've read or watched. And I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, it's something that, that very much excites me. Um, so in some sense, you know, yes, I am teaching quality. And that's what Piercing is trying to do is he's trying to help us understand the structure of our values. He's trying to help us understand what's most valuable. And I think, you know, in some sense, like I said, definitionally, that's the most important thing you could do is figure out, okay, what is valuable and then aim for it, right? Um, I think particularly in the modern world, we have let's say, extra reason to think about our values. We have extra reason to think about what is best. And Piercing certainly thinks that. And I think it's probably at least as true as it was 50 years ago when he wrote Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Maybe even truer now. Um, yes, yeah, so value, like materialistic or intangible. This is the question. This is the question, man. And this is exactly what Piercing is going to get into. Uh, it's it, He's going to get into all these questions about ethics and metaphysics. And they're, they're naughty questions, not... They're naughty as in like a knot, right? Like they're they're very tough questions. They're uh, very difficult to unravel. And and Piercing actually does, I think, a very good job in 500 pages of presenting many of these ideas in a fairly conversational and approachable way. And I hope that uh, what I present here will also be uh, conversational and approachable and not too dense, although I do hope that it will be uh, complex and profound as the material, frankly, warrants. Um, but back to why the modern world in particular needs... A discussion about values, right? So, uh, you know, many of you are probably familiar with the quote from Nietzsche, 
uh, that God is dead. And of course, what Nietzsche meant by that, uh, my one of my undergraduate professors had a great way of describing this. He said, you know, what that means is not that the God of the Old Testament or that Zeus, you know, it doesn't mean that he tripped and fell in the bathroom one day and then passed away and went to the morgue and was buried. Uh, instead, what Nietzsche is saying, uh, roughly speaking, is that the the core principles, the philosophic foundations, the core values and ideas of Western civilization were suddenly being called into question in very, very dramatic ways, right? And a lot of this, you know, comes from the Enlightenment. A lot of this comes from the Scientific Revolution. Uh, there's other sources as well. The 20th century was absolutely brutal in terms of destroying uh, people's worldviews. Uh, World War One, in particular, uh, you know, I think as an American, I do not there's no way that I can understand the impact that World War One had on the on, on European psyches. Uh, my understanding is that you know it's just it's just incredibly traumatic to send millions of your people off to die, and at the end of that, you're like, okay, man, what was it for? Like, what what was this all about? This must have this. There has to be something to justify this, and uh, you know, so many of these you know British well British soldiers. Uh, I'm thinking of the line in particular. You know, you go out for God and country, right? And, and that narrative starts to lose its force for you over the course of World War I, and it just demolishes the whole structure of your, of your world. It demolishes the whole structure of your beliefs. And that's what Nietzsche is getting at when he says, uh, when he talks about the death of God, uh, you know, God is dead and it is we who have killed him. It's this idea that the structure of our beliefs, the structure of our understanding about what the world is and what our place in it is, and what we should be aiming for and how we should live with, with each other, that whole structure is disintegrating. And uh, you know, in some respects, that can be a very positive thing, right? Uh, if you if you destroy the foundations of a building, you can shore them up and make the building more earthquake resistant, and that's you know a very worthwhile thing. You know, and perhaps you even need to demol demolish the building and build a new one. That's also a possibility. But it's also certainly a very, very, very dangerous project. It's an incredibly dangerous project. Um, and if you if you mess it up, if you don't do a good job of rebuilding those foundations, if you can't build secure foundations, uh, then words cannot describe how terrible that is going to be for you individually and for you as a society. Um, humans absolutely need to understand the world. They absolutely need to, you know, you don't need to know everything, but you need to have some kind of mental map of what it's all about. And you need to be aiming at something. You need to have values. You need to have goals. And, you know, maybe they're not perfect and fair enough. And maybe you need to change them and fair enough, but you need them just, just to function. Um, and actually my understanding is that there's quite fascinating neurological and psychological evidence for that, um, that we can't operate without uh, aiming with our eyes. We can't operate without looking at something. More metaphorically, you could say you cannot operate in the world. You can't act in the world. You can't even see without aiming for something. Um, and so this this whole like corrosion of values and corrosion of worldviews is is really, really, really serious. And yeah, the comments in the chat, right? Clan struggle and territorial aggression, right? Why World War One happened, right? So, so what you end up with, um, if these structures of values erode is, well, you end up with chaos, right? Uh, you know, so many things about the world are nice and simple and ordered. Well, actually, they're being quite disordered now because of the coronavirus. But in general, in the world, you know, so many things are nice and structured and ordered. You go to the grocery store and you know that there will be food because that's, there's that whole supply chain. And everybody in that supply chain has done the things that need to be done so that you can get a loaf of bread, right? Um, or, you know, as simple as you flip the switch and the lights turn on. And that means that all the workers in that supply chain have done what they need to. Uh, so that you can flip on the lights and get electricity. Everything is working together. Everything is working together, you know, if not perfectly, at least reasonably and functionally well. And so if you start disintegrating that structure, then all of a sudden, like, the whole complexity of the world just floods right back in on you. It just floods right back in on you. Um, you know, if you can imagine waking up in the morning and having to re-ask all the questions, where am I going to get my clothes? Where am I going to get my food? Where am I going to sleep tonight? Right, it just adds this... this near intolerable level of complexity to the world. And so if you can imagine cultures doing that, right, uh, that's that's the kind of thing that destroying your cultural, philosophic, uh, and ideological foundations can do to you. And so it's a very, very risky, dangerous project. And well, we've kind of done it, right? Um, in many ways, you know, you, you kind of can't put... <sighs> You can't you can't put it all back in the box. You can't put the jack back in the box. You can't undo these changes. Um, and so you need to find a way to sort of rebuild your structures of meaning. And that's what Piercing is. That's one of the things that Piercing is going to be trying to do in this book is to try to give us 
a better account a better account of what the world is made of and how we should look at it and how we should act in it and you know i mean i've been talking about the way that this can shape the destiny of nations and the destiny of communities right and it absolutely does do that it absolutely does do that uh, this sort of process of, of disintegrating and rebuilding structures of meaning um but there's also a very personal dimension to it too that's much more let's say mundane right uh you know many people have the experience of you know i think everyone has it at least from time to time but many people have the constant experience of uh, of, of meaninglessness, of trying to figure out, okay, well, where's the value in my life? What is this all about? And what are we, uh, what are we aiming for? And you know that that uh, sense of value can be recalibrated and rekindled through a variety of activities, right? Like, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we do go backpacking in nature. This is one of the reasons why we experience nature. This is one of the reasons why we relax, and so on and so forth. Um, but but you know, I, I, when I think about the opioid crisis and so many other things, I do see an absolute crisis of meaning in modern society. And I'm not sure exactly how deep and how bad it is. And you know, life is not always going to be full of meaning. There's some things that you just have to get through for sure. Um, but I do worry that we don't. Well, we don't know what's valuable, and we don't know how to pursue what's valuable. We don't know what quality is, and we don't know how to get it. And that causes damage to us personally. That causes damage to our families and to our networks of associates and friends and coworkers and colleagues, and that also causes damage to our broader communities and nations and to the whole world. So, in general, that's why I think this inquiry into values is important, is because is because the destiny of the world and everyone in it rests on it. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about why it would be valuable for this channel in particular. Uh, and oh, I do want to comment, you know, that there's a question in the chat, doesn't society drive these values getting morphed? And and yeah, so some of these, you know, we can run into this societally, right? So, uh, you know, after World War I, everybody in Europe stops and thinks, hey man, you know, this war thing is not going to work out for us. And and this is one of the reasons why Neville Chamberlain before World War II uh, is, is so loath to directly confront Hitler. And, you know, he's not the only one. It, it, like, it's easy for us to look back now and say, well, Neville Chamberlain was an appeaser. And, you know, okay, sure. But I, I certainly think, I, I as an American, you know, America has not been invaded by, by a foreign power in something like two over 200 years, right? Not since the War of 1812, I believe. And so, like, we can't, as an American, I don't know if I really understand the, the incredible impact that World War One and World War II have on the European psyche. And if there's any Europeans in the chat, I'd be uh, interested to hear your comments. Um, yeah, this is a Chautauqua. This is a Chautauqua, exactly. I'm giving a Chautauqua about a Chautauqua. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, we'll be getting to that briefly um, in the chat. Or excuse me, in the, in the course of this discussion. So let's see, where was I? Oh yeah, so society, before I talk about why, it's, why this lecture series is relevant to the channel, there was a question in the chat. Doesn't society drive these values getting morphed? And the answer is yes, but it's not just society. It's also individual choices. Each of us, all the time as we move through life, as we make decisions and as different events happen to us, we're sort of reshaping our map of what the world is and what's valuable and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, um, you in, in, in a whole host of ways, right? You get a job and you're like, oh man, like this... This job is not cutting it for me or you start studying a major and you're like oh you know that was not the right major to pick let's get out of here as fast as we can so we're always reshaping these values individually and as a society it's uh it's, it's happening at all levels right it's happening at all levels simultaneously okay so why this whole uh why, why talking about zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance is relevant to to our channel right so i mean if you look at the last videos we posted on our channel they're about firing crucibles they're about uh how to sanitize yourself without toilet paper um let's see what are the other recent videos that we've posted um they, they don't seem immediately relevant to sort of like a long-form discussion on on philosophy um so why is it relevant because it because i would say it is and i think and you know other joseph absolutely would agree um I've talked to him about this, that it is valuable um, for us to for us to talk about philosophy. So so why? Why is that relevant to technology? Well, I think we'll see a lot of the answers to that unfold as we look through the book, as we look through Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. You know, I, I, I hope it's very obvious that, that Piercig is pretty concerned about technology and that he seems to think there's a connection between technology and philosophy. And so I think as we move through the book, we'll see some of that play out. Um... 
we'll see some of that play out. I would also say, remember, here's part of the relationship between technology and values. The technologies that you pick depend to a large degree on your values. Uh, for instance, right now we're trying to develop uh, a certain piece of technology, a certain tool called a vaccine to the coronavirus. And that's very, very, very important to us right now. Okay, well, that's interesting. You know, uh, but that all seems predicated on ideas about the value of human life, the idea that, you know, maybe we actually uh, don't want lots of people to die from the coronavirus if we can do anything about it. It all seems predicated on that sort of structure of values. If we didn't value human life, if we thought, you know, actually, it's pretty great for everybody to die of diseases. That's That's just wonderful. Um, then we wouldn't bother developing a coronavirus at all. But we do, and we do because we value human life, not least. There's other reasons too, but not least because we value human life. Our technology is an expression of our values. And this also works in reverse. Every technology expresses a value, and every value, let's say, gives rise to technology. And if, you know, that can happen in very, very, very negative ways, right? Uh, you know, so for example, uh, Hitler and the Nazis have to figure out and it, it, I mean, this is a terrible, terrible thing, obviously, right? But there is sort of like this engineering side to the problem where they're like, okay, how can we detain captives as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible, move them to camps as efficiently as possible, and then kill them as efficiently as possible, right? And those sort of technological questions are expressions of those values. So if you don't believe this matters, boy, like, I don't know what to tell you, right? This, this absolutely does matter. This absolutely does matter. Um... And it also, it also uh, works in reverse, where you can look at your technologies and start to find values inherent in them, right? So, for instance, the fact that, you know, uh, we run huge portions of our power grid and so forth on fossil fuels does indicate values on our part, right? And, and uh, you know, I, I don't mean that as an, as an unqualified condemnation of the system we have now. Uh, you know, there's, there's many things we're doing to... Uh, move to more, let's say, uh, ecologically responsible methods of producing and using energy, and and it's not it's not terribly easy, right? Like if you, it turns out if you build an economy for two hundred years on fossil fuels, and then and then try to change everything, it's like okay, that is actually not an easy project, right? So I don't want to oversimplify things here, um, or be ungrateful for what we do have because what we do have is actually quite remarkable. But you can look at the technologies we're using and say, oh look, so we've been using fossil fuels, so. Uh, that indicates some values on our part. We're also trying to pivot over into more renewable energy sources, uh, more uh, ecologically responsible energy sources. Well, that also indicates something about our values too. Like, oh, I don't know that we might actually want to, uh, to some reasonable degree, minimize our negative impact on the planet. Um, uh, we might want to be ecologically responsible. We might want to have some kind of energy after fossil fuels run out, uh, you know, assuming that they do run out with within some meaningful time frame for us um so i mean technology and values go hand in hand they absolutely go hand in hand so that i think is the main relevance to what we're doing on the channel here is that we other joseph and i see see technologies and see appropriate technology as an embodiment of ideas and values so there you go um, yeah, so there's a great question in the chat. Is the tool dangerous or is the wielder the danger? Yeah, this is exactly the kind of thing that Piercing is going to talk about. So I'm glad he asked that question. I'm actually not going to answer it now because it'll it'll make more sense as we move through Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. But I mean, that is the kind of question that Piercing wants to answer, actually. Um, okay, well, let's see. So we've talked about what this lecture series is going to look like. We've talked about why I'm doing it. I think it's about time we can probably jump straight into Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, and the... First thing I want to do is to remind you of this quote, right? There's a couple of pieces of front matter in the book. And there's the author's note that I read you about how the book isn't very factual on Zen and also isn't very factual on motorcycles. Um, there's, there's a quote at the very beginning. Uh, it's an adapted quote from one of Plato's dialogues. And what is good, Phaedrus, and what is not good, need we ask anyone to tell us these things? And that question, you know, it's, it's the, the question is, okay, so what's good and what's bad? What, what's valuable and what's not valuable? What's high quality and what's low quality? Um, how do we find out what that is? Because there's actually quite a few arguments about it. Uh, and it's not even easy, you know, even if you don't listen to other people, there, you argue with yourself about what's valuable. Uh, you know, everybody who has, uh, you know, tried to discipline themselves whether that's uh, exercise or school or work or anyone or a diet, for example, you know, knows that it's not always easy to figure out what's best and it's not always easy to pursue what's best. 
So that's the question that that's probably the meditative question that I I think I I want to ponder and I invite all of you to ponder as we move through this lecture series. Okay, so what is good and what is not good? How are we going to know that? Okay, um, I should have also mentioned when I began this that uh, I actually have prepared something like 30,000 words of lecture notes about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, so I'm going to be relying on that heavily. Um, one of the reasons that I've put off doing this lecture series is because uh, is because it's such a big project that I want to do it justice, and perhaps I cannot do it perfect justice, but, but I'm going to do my best. Okay, so chapter one of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And I, I'm going to periodically read quotes from these as part of the, as part of the, as part of the discussion, right? So here's a quote. Unless you're fond of hollering, you don't make great conversations on a running cycle. Instead, you spend your time being aware of things and meditating on them, on sights and sounds, on the mood of the weather and things remembered, on the machine and the countryside you're in, thinking about things at great leisure and length, without being hurried and without feeling you're losing time. We're in such a hurry most of the time that we never get much chance to talk. The result is a kind of day-to-day -day shallowness, a monotony that leaves a person wondering years later where all the time went and sorry that it's all gone. Now that we do have some time and know it, I would like to use the time to talk in some depth about things that seem important. So the plot premise of this book here is that Piercig is on a motorcycle trip with his son, Chris. And that's actually the picture that you're seeing there is, I believe it's the same motorcycle that they rode across the country. Um, hey, thanks for the collab suggestion, by the way. I sorry, I got distracted by a comment in chat. Um, thanks for the collab suge suggestion. We'll uh, be sure to take a look at that and see uh, see if that interests us and if they're interested in what we can do. Um, sorry, where was I? So Piercig and his son are riding across the country on a motorcycle. It's a, uh, they're riding from, I think, I think it's Minnesota, uh, somewhere in Minnesota, out to the Dakotas, out, uh, out through the Dakotas to um, a place in Montana called Bozeman. And they might go further. They're also traveling with uh, two of their friends, John and Sylvia, who are going to be characters in this narrative as well. And uh, they're, John and Sylvia are going to go as far as Bozeman, Montana, and then uh, Chris and Piercig might end up going a little bit further than that. But he says, you know, I haven't got fixed plans about how this is going to go. The plans are deliberately left indefinite. Uh, it's more to travel well than to arrive. And that's a lot of what this first chapter is about. Um, before, let's see, yeah, before I get to that, though, I want to talk about um, sort of the narrative structure of this book. So one of the things that makes this book so interesting and also so difficult to untangle um, is, is the, the relationship between the philosophic meaning of the book and the narrative of the book, right? So what this book is going to be is it's, it's interspersed of uh, him narrating this trip across the United States on a motorcycle, and then also what he's going to call a Chautauqua, which is sort of this uh, extended philosophic discussion on various topics. And that's going to form the bulk of the book, is him switching between this narrative mode and this um, explanatory mode. And I, I think by doing that, he's, you know, one thing that he's doing is he's actually trying to model, um, he's trying to model how philosophy should be done. Uh, I minored in philosophy. Uh, I almost had enough credits to major, but I wanted to graduate and get done. But I minored in philosophy, and actually I studied under some very remarkable individuals, um, including Elijah Milgram, who's uh, one of the world's foremost experts on a branch of philosophy called practical reasoning. Um, so uh, one of the things that bothers me about academic philosophy, and that might bother you too, I think it might bother a lot of people, is that a lot of the time it seems very sort of abstract and disconnected. It seems like it doesn't really... Uh, connect in any way to the real world, right? Like you think about the trolley car experiment and you're like, if you're not familiar with the trolley car experiment, I won't explain it, but you can go ahead and Google it. I'm sure you've heard of it before. You know, you think about the trolley car experiment and you're like, okay, you know, who is thinking all of this up, right? And and it, uh, there's there's so often in academic philosophy the sense that it doesn't have any real connection to real human beings. And and I think that that's partially unfair. You can connect ph academic philosophy to, to real human beings in real situations in many ways. Uh, but it's not easy to see how that happens. And one of the things that Piercing is going to try to do is to show us how that happens. He's going to try to show the connections between sort of like high-level abstract philosophical ideas and then sort of how you live on a daily basis and how that you know might play out in a trip across the Dakota on a motorcycle. Um, there's a part in the book where he says, I think metaphysics is good if it helps you with your daily life, if not, forget it. 
and that tends to be my attitude about philosophy as well is that i i, I absolutely love philosophy i love intellectual discussion i love uh, getting into these deep ideas i love discussions um but at the same time i always want to be able to see where it goes i want to be able to apply it in some way i want it to be meaningful and for it to be meaningful part of that seems to mean it has to it has to connect to things outside of itself it has to not just be what you do in a university classroom it has to be something that you live and interspersing this narrative with this sort of philosophic exposition allows piercing to explore the relationship between those things and to show us to not only tell us but to show us let's say um so it's a really cool it's, it's a really cool framing device and you'll see we'll point out some places in the story where um he's acting out the ideas or foreshadowing the ideas through narrative that he's going to talk about in the Chautauqua or that he's already talked about in the Chautauqua. So they move in absolute tandem. You have sort of like practical day-to-day -day living combined with philosophy together. And it's just, it's, it's a, it's an incredible format. It's an incredible format. It also makes the ideas quite a bit easier to jet, to digest. Um, for that matter, it makes the book quite a bit more approachable. If you don't, you know, if you have never read Kant, if you've never, taken formal classes in philosophy then this is actually not that bad of an introduction to philosophy and it's a fairly approachable uh, introduction as far as that goes at least that's my sense <sighs> okay sorry let me skip forward in my notes we've gotten past a lot of stuff Okay, so as we said, Piercig and Chris are on a motorcycle. They're taking a trip across the Dakotas with John and Sylvia. And, you know, you just have to stop and kind of enjoy the enjoy the prose here. It's one of the more beautiful sections of the book, I think, as he describes uh, riding through these marshes, seeing the red-winged blackbirds fly up. Um, that sort of sense, if you've ever been on a motorcycle, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, or maybe if you've gone hiking in the early morning, you know, you, uh, you it's it's early in the morning, the sun is coming up, it's not too warm yet, um, it's still somewhat cool, and it's just, uh, you're just enjoying the world, you're enjoying nature, you're enjoying life. That's kind of the experience that they're having now. Um, but he wants to talk to us a little bit about motorcycles. And motorcycles are going to be a metaphor for a variety of things as we go through the book. And so it's really worth noticing the way he describes motorcycles. It's really worth thinking about uh, what he might be trying to tell us or what we might learn from looking at his experience on the motorcycle. So he tells us that um, you see things vacationing on a motorcycle in a way that is completely different from any other. If you've got any motorcycle riders in the chat, you know, uh, let me know and tell me your experience because this is, I, I think he's dead on as he describes this. You see things vacationing on a motorcycle in a way that is completely different from any other. In a car, you're always in a frame, excuse me, always in a compartment. And because you're used to it, you don't realize that through that car window, everything you see is just more TV. You're a passive observer, and it is all moving by you, boringly, in a frame. On a cycle, the frame is gone. You're completely in contact with it all. You're in the scene, not just watching it anymore. And the sense of presence is overwhelming. That concrete whizzing by five inches below your foot is the real thing. The same stuff you walk on. It's right there, so blurred you can't focus on it. Yet you can put your foot down and touch it any time, and the whole thing, the whole experience is never removed from immediate consciousness. Um, so, uh, what, if you've ever ridden a motorcycle, you know, this is exactly right. You know, if you're driving in a car, you feel you're separated off from the world because you're in this steel and glass compartment, right? But when you're on a motorcycle and you're hurtling down the freeway at 80 miles an hour, um, I don't know how many kilometers an hour that is. It's probably something like 100 or 120, I think. Uh, but it, when you're hurtling down the freeway at 80 miles an hour on a motorcycle, like you, you look down for a second and you see the, the concrete whizzing past you and you look you know, to your right and there's a truck coming past you and you look to your left and there's a semi coming past you um, or you're going past them perhaps uh, you know, because you're on a motorcycle and you've got that need for speed. Um, it's all so real and you know, it's also partially uh, so, so threatening. You realize uh, to an incredible degree how fragile your life is and how it could all you know, end in just a fraction of a second. And that's, it, it's an incredible, um, it's an incredible feeling. You know, there's, there's some fear there, but there's also this tremendous sense of aliveness. Um, and also, you know, another thing you don't think about when you are in a car is that when you're on a motorcycle, uh, you can smell things. So you drive past a bakery and you get all the smells of fresh bread, or you drive through, um, through a park or through a, some, some kind of wilderness area or nature area, and you smell all the smells of nature. 
Uh, the temperature changes as you drive. You're in the experience. So he's going to talk about, you know, one of the things that this makes me think about is that relationship between philosophy and real life. Um, that it, there's something about real life that's deeply experiential and therefore deeply real. Whereas philosophy tends to look at these experiences and analyze them. And because of that, it's always just a little bit after the fact. And it, and it misses something that the experience has. It misses something that the experience ha uh, itself has. Uh, responding to a particular comment in the chat about um, uninterrupted silence and why that... Uh, why it has a unique peacefulness. I mean, there could be a variety of reasons, I think. I'm not trying to be too reductionistic here. Um, but one of the reasons is because, let's say, instead of thinking about things, you're, you're experiencing things. Rather than sort of mentally being in a car, you're mentally being on a motorcycle. And because of that, you're much more connected, let's say, to the world around you. Um, and and Piercing is going to be very interested in that as we go through. He's going to be very interested in this experience of rather than, uh, you know, being separated from reality, as in a car, being in close contact with reality, enmeshed with it, let's say, um, as he is on a motorcycle as he travels across the Dakotas. So motorcycles remove the frame, right? Um, they remove the distance, right? They remove the separation. They remove this duality and allow you to... Uh, I mean, if you wanted to put it in kind of a mystical way, be one with the universe, right? But in a more plain way, right, uh, it allows you to to experience things that you've never experienced before, to think about things that you've never thought about before, to notice things that you haven't yet noticed. Um, and that's what, sort of what this metaphor of the motorcycle and the car in my mind is all about, is this sense of, uh, you know, instead of being separated from things, finding the way to uh, directly experience these things. And and by the way, it's worth noting that Piercig is not going to be at all dismissive or skeptical um, of the value of, let's say, thinking in a car, of being able to separate things off and think about them very abstractly and very logically, um, in a sort of a very dualistic way. Um, but he's also going to assign quite a bit of value to, well, to the experiential value of things, let's say, to the experiential nature of things. Um, so... There's that. Um, and, you know, we, we actually see this played out in a couple of different ways. It's interesting. It's not just between the cars and the motorcycles. Um, if you remember, there's a moment where Piercing sees a flock of red-winged blackbirds fly up out of the marsh. And he slaps Chris's knee and says, hey, Chris, did you see that? And Chris is like, what? And Piercing says, uh, there's, a, there's a flight of red-winged blackbirds. And Chris says, oh, you know, I've seen lots of those. Right. So what's interesting is that Piercing, even with those blackbirds, is a little bit more sort of like, let's say, in the experience. Um he sees the red-winged blackbirds and he reacts to it immediately, right? Whereas Chris has this sort of distance, right? He says, oh, I've seen that before. I know what it is. You know, it's it's no longer new and fresh. And there is this thing where, uh, like, with, with familiarity, um, you become desensitized to what's really there. And you sort of interact with your mental model of the world instead of what's really there. I mean, you could think about it like... You know, if you're walking around your house or your apartment in the middle of the night and it's dark and you trip over something um, that you weren't expecting, you know, normally you, you know where the couches are, you know where the table is, you know where everything is. So you can kind of navigate your way through because you don't actually need to see what's there. You just need to have a mental model of what's there, right? You just need a framework. You just need a philosophy of what's there, right? Um, and, and that works really well, usually. Right? But if somebody leaves something there unexpectedly, then you step on a Lego and it kills you probably because it's terrible to step on Legos. Or, you know, you walk into a couch or you stub your, your toe or you do something like that. Um, you, you do something like that. So, uh, sorry, I got distracted by chat real fast. No, I, I, I don't mean to keep, keep chatting, guys. I love the comments, but I, I did get distracted momentarily. Um, so when you're walking through your house in the dark, you're not interacting with the real house, the real objects there because they don't matter. Um, you're interacting with your mental model, and as long as there's a good match between the mental model and what's there, you're set. You're fine. It's when the mental model no longer describes what's going on that you start running into problems. So what's interesting is that Piercig is saying, and by the way, this is you know going back to when we talked about World War One and and the death of God. This is what happens, right? Is your mental model of the world gets disturbed, and you're like, oh man, you know the world is not actually what I thought it was, and so you have to actually look at things again and say, okay, w w wait a second, what is going on here, and how should I think about that? As far as these blackbirds, though, notice that that Piercig. Chris says, well, look, I have a mental model of blackbirds. I've already seen those before. I don't need to, let's say, interact with the real blackbirds. I don't need to see them. I don't need to pay attention to them. Okay? And Piercig is looking at those blackbirds and saying, hey, you know, those, those blackbirds are new and fresh. They've never existed before, and they're worth paying attention to. Right? 
he's interacting, let's say, with the thing itself instead of sort of his mental model of, of the thing. And that's also the same idea that's playing out with the motorcycle and the car, obviously, is that with the car, you know, with that sort of intellectual abstract distance, you're no longer dealing with the thing itself. You're dealing with representations of the thing. You're dealing with a model of the thing. You're dealing with a representation and an idea of the thing, right? And the, that works, but the, that also has some limitations, let's say, right? And that, you know, if you have that kind of attitude, well, you'll never see a flight of red-winged blackbirds and you'll never be able to see that. And, well, you're probably the worst for that. Um, we still need the road to ride the motorcycle. I'm reading a comment in chat. Are we st aren't we sort of being herded? Yeah, you know, you could say that. I mean, you could make an argument for that. Piercing, when we, later in the book, Piercing has this metaphor about, about trains. And, you know, that might be relevant when we get there. Um, yeah, and I mean, this is very fair, right? Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's useful. You know, Piercing, notice that this is an analogy, right? Piercing isn't saying everybody should ride a motorcycle over all the time. Cars are evil. Don't ever drive a car. That's not what this is about, right? Instead, what he's saying is, hey, you know, if, if I look at the way, the difference between a motorcycle and a car, I can actually learn some pretty interesting things about, about how to live my life in other areas, right? And that lesson of how to, so it's an analogy. It's an analogy, right? It's, it's okay, guys, you can drive a car. I drive a car. You drive a car. We all drive cars. This is, this is probably fine, mostly. Um, but, but the value here is the analogy. The value here is to be able to say, oh, well, this is really interesting, right? So I'm looking at the world. What am I missing? What am I not even paying attention to? Because I'm just interacting with my mental model instead of interacting with the real world. Right. And, and here's another interesting idea is that maybe that mental model can even be correct. Right. Like Chris has a certain mental model of blackbirds, of red winged blackbirds. He's like, OK, well, first of all, they're blackbirds, so they're black. Second of all, they're red wings, so they so they're red and they're birds. So they fly and they live in nature and, you know, they fly. So that's nice. Right. And all of those are true facts. It's a true description. Right. The mental model is actually, you know, very correct in some sense. It's very factual. And, you know, perhaps if Chris. I don't know, had some kind of PhD in ornithology or what have you, then he can tell you about the bone structures and the diet of the American red-winged blackbird. Like, he knows all the facts, right? But what's interesting is even knowing those facts and even having those facts be correct, the mental model's fine, the mental model's correct, Chris is still missing out on reality. He's still missing out on reality. So there's a lesson here, and Piercing is going to come back to this again and again, so I'm really glad we kind of stumbled upon it at this stage in the discussion. Um, Piercing is going to say, hey, you know, it's not just that your mental model matches the world and then you need to remake it when the mental model doesn't match the world. He's also going to say, hey, even if your mental model is correct, there's value to interacting with the real thing and perceiving the real thing and appreciating the real thing and, and experiencing the real thing. There's value to that, even if your mental model is correct. So he's going to say, look, the mental model should not take over. The mental model should not be everything that you think about and, and interact with, no matter how correct it is. Even if you've got a good description, right? Even if you know everything about red-winged blackbirds, you should still look at the red-winged blackbirds and appreciate that it's a red-winged blackbird um, and experience that in the moment. And, you know, I, I mean, I think this is really valuable. I'm trying to think of a good example from my own life, but, um, but, but speaking, you know, somewhat generally, you know, you go through life and you don't notice things right? And there's actually a lot of value to noticing things, right? You might miss moments of, sup of supernal beauty, as Chris does in this case. Um, or you will, as we see through the book, as we see through the course of the book, you might also miss those vital, crucial facts that you need to uh, get somewhere. Yeah, I'm glad that uh, Manny Kenton is asking these questions about wandering off the beaten path and what you need. I mean, these are, these are all the questions, right? Um, I mean, this is the danger, right? Like, you could think about, right, this whole death of God thing, um, right, and, and or excuse me, I don't think Nietzsche was only talking about, let's say, um, the rise of secularism and the, yeah, the rise of secularism, let's say. I don't think he was only talking about that. I think he was also saying, uh, you know, in, in all sorts of areas of life, it's hard for us to believe in democracy anymore. It's hard for us to believe in the rule of law. It's hard to believe that we live in, uh, it, it can be hard to believe that we live in a good civilization. It can be hard to believe that we are worthwhile that, that humans are worthwhile and, you know, worth protecting. It can be difficult, right? And so he's not just talking about religion and secularism, Nietzsche. He's, he's talking about the dissolution of, like, all kinds of structures of value, the dissolution of all of these frameworks, um, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of frameworks and ideas. Um, so, I mean, you could also use this this path metaphor that Manny Canton is using, right? That, um, you know, if you wander off the path, 
you might find some really valuable things, right? You might find something beautiful that nobody has found before. Of course, you also might like just get eaten by a mountain lion or a bear, right? That's a distinct possibility. Or you could, you know, not have rations and just starve and die in the wilderness, right? So again, like wandering off this beaten path, dissolving these structures of, of knowledge and value, this is not trivial. This is dangerous, right? Um, that doesn't mean it can't be done. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. But it does mean that it's it's dangerous and there's not a guarantee of success. And it, it, it could be very difficult and there could be a lot of negative consequences and you better hope it goes well. Um, so actually, I kind of like that path metaphor. That path metaphor is quite good. And it will come back when we talk about trains uh, later. Piercing's uh, analogy of trains. Okay, so we've talked quite a bit about motorcycles. We talked talk quite a bit about this analogy. And we've also seen how that plays out with the red-winged blackbirds. Let's see what else we've got here. Um, yeah, okay, so now let's talk about what it's like to vacation on a motorcycle a little bit, because he mentions a few specific experiences that go beyond sort of just the general differences between a motorcycle and a car, and they're really worth uh, thinking about, really worth paying attention to. So let's see, let me get to the right section. So he describes this experience where at first when he and John and Sylvia rode motorcycles, they would just take the main roads, right? You just go on the main roads. Hey, we're getting to this whole path idea, actually. This is wonderful. Um, so you just go on the main roads. And eventually, by accident, they stumbled onto kind of these back roads, these county roads. So, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. <sighs> Presumably, you know, to get from A to B, you know, if you're trying to get from one city to another, there's some kind of major highway, right? And what he found out, at first they just traveled on these major highways, and eventually, um, by accident, if I remember correctly, they stumbled onto one of these these uh, smaller roads off to the side. Um, uh, stumbled into one of these smaller roads off to the side, and um, in doing so, they found out that these smaller roads off to the side, these sort of back roads, these in the United States, they would be county roads as opposed to uh, interstate highways. Um, or, or even state highways, potentially, these, these sort of uh, more rural back roads um, actually end up being much higher quality. They actually end up being much better than traveling on the freeway. And uh, he describes uh, what it's like. Actually, I'm going to try to find this real fast so I can read it. I, I didn't set aside this quote, but it's quite good. Um, yeah. Um, it was some years ago that my wife and I and our friends first began to catch on to these roads. We took them once in a while for variety or for a shortcut to another main highway, and each time the scenery was grand and we left the road with a feeling of relaxation and enjoyment. We did this time after time before realizing what should have been obvious. These roads truly are different from the main ones. The whole pace of life and personality of the people who live along them are different. They're not going anywhere. They're not too busy to be courte courteous. The hereness and newness of things is something they know all about. It's the others, the ones who moved to the cities years ago, and their lost offspring who have all but forgotten it. The discovery was a real find. And uh, he, he describes a little bit later the experience of what it's like to ride on a motorcycle on the freeway. Um, on Labor Day and Memorial Day weekends, we travel for miles... Excuse me, excuse me. On Labor Day and Memorial Day weekends, we travel for miles on these, on these back roads without seeing another vehicle. Then cross a federal highway and look at cars strung bumper to bumper on the horizon. Scowling faces inside, kids crying in the back seat. I keep wishing there were some way to tell them. Something. But they scowl and appear to be in a hurry, and there isn't. Right, so right, he's uh, talking again about these, these cars and how, and really these cars are kind of a metaphor for the modern world, right? Like how many, like how often do you go through life, you know, not literally in a car, but you know, you go to work or school or whatever, uh, and, and, and you are sort of living out this experience of being strung bumper to bumper in your car with scowling faces and kids crying in the back seat, right? Um, and the contrast with the contrast between that and riding a motorcycle along these back country roads where there's, there's nobody there and, and you have this totally different experience, right? This, this much higher quality experience. Um, that's something that, that Piercing, that Piercing and his wife discover as they're riding these, um, back roads. So again, notice that there's sort of this need to restructure the values, right? And and he actually says something really interesting about this. He says, I've wondered why it took us so long to catch on. We saw it, and yet we didn't see it. Or rather, we were trained not to see it, conned perhaps into thinking that the real action was metropolitan, and all this was just boring hinterland. It was a puzzling thing. The truth knocks on the door, and you say, go away, I'm looking for the truth. And so it goes away. 
puzzling. And that that one sort of uh, story there about the truth knocking on the door and you saying, go away, I'm looking for the truth. That's also a, a, a metaphor for, that's a very important idea in this across the span of this whole book, right? And that even just happened with Chris and with Piercing, right? Where, uh, well, let's, let's, let's put it this way. Is it better to know that red-winged blackbirds are black and have red wings, or is it better to see them and experience them? And I think in most cases, the answer is, well, it's better to see them and experience them, right? But what Chris says is, well, I've already seen these before. I already know about these blackbirds, right? And so in, this, in a similar way, you know, Chris slaps, or excuse me, Piercing slaps Chris and says, hey, look, there's something important over here. And what Chris says is, well, no, I don't need that. I already know about that. Right, so the truth knocks on the door, and you say, "Go away! I'm looking for the truth." And so, this is it goes back to this idea that Piercing is going to be trying to convince us in this book. This is one of the, his his core ideas: is that even if your mental map is correct and true, blah blah blah, that's fine. You still need to pay attention to the experience. You still need to pay attention to reality, and that map is not reality, no matter how well it describes reality. Even if it's true, it's still a representation of the real thing, not the real thing. And that's the, that's the, that's, it's really cool because you see that happening with the motorcycle. You see that happening with the car. He talks about, you know, truth knocking on the door. You see it happening with Chris and Piercing and the Red Wing Blackbirds. So again, like, I hope you're seeing that, like, this is unspeakably complex. And this is why, um, you know, the other day I was reviewing a few of the podcasts and sort of discussions about Zam that I've seen. And they all end in like an hour. And I'm like, man, like, there's no way you can do justice to this book in an hour. Uh, it's taken us almost an hour just to get to some of the key ideas in the first chapter. Um, so, okay, so so it's not just the motorcycle and the car. It's also the whole way of traveling that is attendant to motorcycles and cars. And, and also not just to that, but also to the fact that... To the fact that... The truth knocks on the door and you say, go away, I'm looking for the truth. And that, that makes no sense because you're looking for the truth, so why don't you recognize it? Right? And so there's this idea also that your mental model is going to block you in many cases from seeing the truth. And that could be, you know, hypothetically true for any mental model, right? I'm not picking on any worldview right now in particular. Um, whatever your mental model is, as, as wonderful as that is, it's going to get in the way. Think about it like a map and also think about it, you know, I mean, well, here's a, here, this is actually a good example, right? Think about it like a map for traveling and then also the experience of traveling, right? Like it actually turns out that, you know, you could just you know, go to your map and point out all the locations and say, well, it is 40 miles from here to here. And then, you know, this place has such and such attractions and it has six flags or it has, you know, uh, Sedona National Water Slides and stuff like that, right? And it's like, okay, you know, sure. But, and all that's true and fair enough, but it's still not as good as actually going there. You know, like uh, people prefer to go on vacation than they do to just, you know, go on Google Maps and look at the place. Although Google Maps is really cool and, you know, better than nothing, especially now that we're all, uh, kind of cooped up uh, due to coronavirus. Uh, but but the point is, it's, it's still, it has its uses, but it's the experience itself is valuable. And it's easy to lose sight of that experience itself. It's very easy. And that's going to be a consistent theme throughout Piercing, throughout Piercing's book. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, is there anything else we need to tackle from chapter one? Da, 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 da. Um, here, here's a thing worth mentioning, right? Here's a thing worth mentioning, right? Is these frameworks, uh, to a large degree, uh, determine your values. They determine sort of what direction you go. They determine what you do, right? It, you know, your philosophy of life, or even just your philosophy of college, right? You know, or your philosophy of your workplace or whatever. You have these ideas and mental models about what's supposed to happen there, and that's what helps guide your action, right? So here's something interesting, is that... You might ask, okay, well, how do you ever, excuse me, let's say modify that framework or move from one framework to another? Because your frameworks in some sense are going to try to, you know, assign value to things, right? Like many frameworks we have um, talk about value um, and, you know, what you should aim for and how you should live in the world. And so how can you ever switch to another framework given that your framework is, is always sort of governing. And the motorcycle, I hope that makes sense. The, this whole motorcycle car analogy kind of gives us an answer to that because Piercing is saying reality is going to, if you're if you're properly attuned, reality will flood through. 
right? If you're properly attuned to reality, you'll be able to see not only your mental model, but you're, you'll be able to see what's really going on there. You'll be able to see reality or, or touch reality. I don't know which metaphor you prefer. Um, but you'll be able to see reality and your mental model and then be able to tweak the mental model when it needs it. Okay. All right, I think I want to make um, two, two last notes. Wow, okay, so we're actually at about 55 minutes. This is, I thought we'd get all the way through chapter one, and we're not all the way through chapter one. Um, and we've got it for about an hour, and I'm not sure if I want to go much longer than an hour. If you have an opinion on that, feel free to throw it in the chat. I haven't really decided yet because I was hoping to get further. Uh, but there's nothing necessarily bad with putting it off, right? You know, sometimes it's better to travel than to arrive, as, as Piercing is teaching us. Um, let's see. So the other things I want to talk about are Chautauquas, and I want to talk about the duck hunting sloughs real briefly. And then, and then we also need to talk about the subject of the Chautauqua, about, um, about systems. And you know, I think, I think I'm going to go ahead and, uh, let's see. Can I fold all those in? Yeah, you know, I think I think this probably is a, a reasonably good place to stop. So I'll just make uh, one final observation, um, and then and then we'll close up for now, because um, because uh, I, I want to stay sharp. And then I, I I'm hoping this Friday I'll uh, do the second one and we'll finish chapter one and get to chapter two. Um, so so the duck hunting sloughs. Now, this is one thing I haven't figured out. So if anyone has any ideas about this, either now or as we move through the book, I'm really curious about this. So the duck, he, he mentions duck hunting sloughs, and he mentions his childhood hunting for ducks in these, uh, in these marshes, right? And what's really interesting is that these duck hunting sloughs get mentioned again in the last chapter of the book. And if you've read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, you know that the last chapter of the book is really, really, really important, right? So, so the thing that I, st one thing that I still have not figured out is, why does Piercing talk about the duck hunting sloughs right at the beginning and right at the end. What's that all about? And I'm, I'm frankly not sure, so I'm actually just throwing out that out there. I don't have anything to say about it. I have no clue. I frankly have no clue. Um, but I hope that I'll figure it out as we move through, and maybe you'll have some good ideas about that. Um, we haven't talked about the Chautauqua yet. I'm going to save the Chautauqua for next time. Um, the reason being that he talks about technology and about systems and rationality, and that will actually, um, I think, go really nicely into the material in Chapter 2. So, um, let's see. I'm just making sure there's nothing else. Yeah, so I think I'll just close up by saying uh, this has been a wonderful opportunity to talk to you all. Um, it is a Chautauqua, just like Pier 6 Chautauqua. And we'll talk next time about Chautauquas and about what Pier 6 Chautauqua is going to be all about. So... Um, thank you all very much. I'm still, this is new streaming software that I'm using, so I'm actually just going to let the stream run for a little while afterwards um, uh, to, to make sure it doesn't um, cut it off too much. Uh, again, I'll be, if you've never read the book, um, I hope you'll uh, pick up a copy. I'll leave a link in the description to Amazon where you can pick it up. Um, if you have read the book, then, well, I hope you'll uh, gain a deeper understanding through this lecture series. Um, so thanks very much for uh tuning in whether you're watching this now or whether you're watching this in the future um, or whether you're listening to this on the podcast thanks very much it's been an absolute pleasure um, and i will see you all next time